perfect organism. Well, I did it, all right? It's done. I killed him. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Rise a night! Rise a night! We got a Black Hawk down. We got a Black Hawk down. If you created me, who created you? And a bottle of wine that tastes like you. A glass that's never empty. Yannick, if you don't stop it, it won't be any home to go back to. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? And hello, here is another installment of Ridley Scott, The Duelist. I am Sean Nolan. So thank you again. And on this episode, we're going to be discussing a duel between uh, two films that I best would describe as being a bit of outliers uh, of the Ridley Scott canon. Uh, Let me kind of word it this way. Does anyone remember when Ridley Scott made a... uh, (laughs) Remember when he made a romantic thriller? I'm sure that most people would say, no. Some people might remember when he made what I guess is kind of a romantic comedy uh, in 2006... They might also not know that he did. Uh, I think when a lot of people think of Ridley Scott, they think of big movies, big atmospheric films uh, such as Blade Runner, uh, Gladiator, uh, maybe overblown epics like uh, Exodus or, uh, you know, some of these alien movies uh, that a lot of uh, fanboys have uh, been attacking lately. Uh, but, uh, you know, he has what I've described a lot of times as being an extremely eclectic filmography. So the two films that we'll talk about in this duel are going to be Someone to Watch Over Me from 1987. Remember that movie? A lot of people don't. But it's okay. We're going to talk about it. And the other one in, uh, that it's dueling against is going to be 2006, A Good Year. So here we go. Uh, someone to watch over me. After watching the movie, the best way for me to kind of summarize my feelings are it definitely looks like a Ridley Scott movie has that that uh, visual aesthetic. Uh, there is shards of light uh, that became kind of characteristic of a lot of films from uh, Ridley Scott or his brother Tony Scott. Uh, some of the, uh, uh, the composition of shots and the way that they will fill the, uh, you know, fill the screen looked like something that you would see from a Ridley Scott movie. Uh, it also, look, uh, it seems like an extremely generic action movie from the late 80s. If you would have told me that a, that it was just like a, a studio, uh, you know, appointed director, some kind of guy who was a, uh, a little bit of a journeyman, uh, just kind of, you know, the some producer, some big time producer just needed to put a guy in the director's chair to make this movie. I would say, yeah, that makes sense. Looking at it, it it uh, it does seem like a movie that is lacking in a little bit of a personality. Of course, when you think about somebody like Ridley Scott. It's uh, it's following up on Legend, his uh, you know the fantasy movie he made with uh, with unicorns and goblins, and how the how well that was received. I'm sure he probably needed 
something different. And he had an interesting run after Legend of making certain kind of movies. Uh, I actually described it as he became Tony Scott for a couple of films. Uh, And uh, because there's a couple of these movies that he made after Legend and before uh, the Christopher Columbus movie. Uh, um, 1492, which if you would have said Tony Scott directed these, I'd be like, yeah, oh, that that looks about right. Seems about right. The the kind of film. Uh, so someone to watch over me. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I well, you know, here's what's really crazy. Shout Factory put out a Blu-ray, which I got to watch. It looks nice. Uh, I had seen the movie prior. And, uh, you know, stars Tom Berenger. And it's all about a, uh, a cop uh, detective who is uh, put in charge of looking after uh, a witness. And, you know, you'd think, well, what, what does this movie have in common with the movie it's dueling with? Uh, a Good Year, where in that you have Russell Crowe as a stockbroker I, I guess I'm a little a little wonky on exactly what his profession is but he's a trader or a stockbroker uh, who has to uh, close out the affairs of his late uncle in uh, France uh, and a good year is a movie that is, at its heart it's 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 a little bit of a it's a light romantic light comedy uh but done in a very Ridley Scott way both of these movies look gorgeous even though they have nothing in common genre wise both of them do have one interesting theme in common which is a part of this whole thing with having the dual of uh, two films, you know, uh, going back on the title about this being Ridley Scott, the duelist. Uh, So our protagonists are men that are taken out of their comfort zone. Tom Berenger being a working class stiff, uh, like blue collar cop living in Queens has to babysit a Manhattan socialite and you have uh, Russell Crowe being a very posh London trader who goes to the the French country and is taken out of his comfort zone and both of them in essence they uh, they fall in love with a woman and uh to varying degrees of, uh, of results. Uh, it's uh, just amazing some of the, the, the characters you come across in these two movies. Uh, I'm going to circle back to uh, uh, someone to watch over me. The, uh, the, the main thread of that movie is that there is a, uh, a murder and the man that uh, uh, that is the main threat uh, is he's uh, he's played by uh, this character actor uh, Andreas Katsoulis. I might be pronouncing that wrong. Such a menacing presence. Uh, some people will remember him as being the one-armed man from the uh, the Fugitive, uh, the movie with uh, uh, Harrison Ford. Uh, he's a very distinctive look of a man. Uh, he's Greek and yet he has a tendency to always play Italian gangsters or, uh, well, <laughs> terrorists. <laughs> uh, he's playing an Italian in, uh, in this movie. Uh, and he is, uh, just a very, very menacing, uh, type of presence. Uh, I, I think his look does half of the, uh, job of, uh, casting as far as the the villain of this, 
the, the, the there isn't quite the same kind of villainy in uh, a good year. It's one of more of these uh, things of like you know, man against himself, man against uh, you know his his past, his lifestyle. Uh, like I said, a good year is a little more a little more innocent. It's a little more light. Uh, <laughs> I mean, these two movies couldn't be any more different because of the fact that uh, someone to watch over me uh, it does have some scenes of violence, and a good year has like no violence at all. Uh, has some very charming scenes of of wine and eating and conversation, uh, and uh, on the, the the flip side of that. Someone to Watch Over Me uh, is this uh, movie where, you know, Tom Berenger almost kind of seems like he's he's trying too hard to not come off as a, uh, as somebody who would be like a learned person. He, I, I, I almost kind of feel like the New York accent is a little forced and some of the, the blue collar uh, aspects of him may be a little too, I would say, uh, they're almost a little forced. Where, I, you know, I mean, Russell Crowe, d- despite his physical change, which we will get into when we talk about uh, Body of Lies, Russell Crowe is uh, a very accomplished actor um, and I, I tend to find that a lot of his performances are not very forced he seems like a uh, you know I mean he I mean he's from New Zealand you know New Zealand uh, an Australian actor from New Zealand who comes you know he, he's able to uh, you know pull off his his London accent uh, and you know, there, you you really do believe he is who he is. You know, have, having to go to the French countryside. Um, you know, and I guess in his way, he he feels like he's he's fighting off these hicks there. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, I I when I'm thinking about. Uh, you know, um, Scott's uh, oeuvre, I, it was odd to kind of come across what really did seem like the only generic movie that he ever made. Uh, and I'm, I'm speaking about uh, someone to watch over me. Uh, it's a, I, I, it almost feels like it's a very forgotten movie. And I don't think there's a lot to say as far as, you know, like what this uh, movie really offers as far as, you know, uh, uh, you know, as far as like being like, it's, it's not a great film. It's, it's very entertaining, kind of hits all the marks, but there's something, there's something about it where if you were to put a lot of the films of that he's done, it wouldn't be something that I would immediately pick out. You know, it. Uh, you know, I've listened to some podcasts where uh, you know they were kind of talking about Ridley and Tony Scott. I'll get a little more into this when we start talking about the what I like to call the Tony Scott movies that Ridley Scott made. But uh, I I always kind of thought that what was what really was great about Ridley Scott is that when he made something, I mean he he would go whole hog on it, and which leaves him wide open to people to ridicule him and say, "Wow, what an overblown piece of shit that you made." And I would almost appreciate the fact that he went for it. This is a movie that I feel like is it was it was a uh, for hire, uh, and 
there's not a lot of stake in it. Uh, it looks like a movie that they probably could have offered to somebody of that, uh, you know, who's making films at that like that. Um, you know, if uh, if this had followed up, you know, somebody uh, like a, a movie like uh, Near Dark, and you'd said, "Oh, C- Catherine Bigelow made uh, made someone to watch over me." I'd say, "Yeah, that makes a lot of sense." Because it seems like something that Catherine Bigelow would make or uh, John Badham. They, they, they seem like the, the kind of action films, uh, especially movies, you know, with, you know, cops and, uh, you know, uh, you know, the type of thing where you have like a clear good guy, bad guy, you know, the white hat and the black hat. When it would come to like watching a Scott movie, I think maybe you have to keep yourself a little open to the fact that the white hat isn't always going to be so white. The black hat has got many different degrees and shades. Uh, so with, uh, you know, I, maybe that's one of the reasons why I going to kind of turn this a little over and start kind of talking about a good year. Because here you have a movie. He made a good year comes out after Kingdom of Heaven which was like a colossal failure for him. And here he's, he's got this movie that comes out like directly after. So it must have been something that he was thinking of doing. I don't know if it was because he liked wine or he just wanted to have a change of pace after taking on a movie that would, you know, must have taken years of his life to, uh, to you know, get off the ground. And him and Russell Crowe go to France and make like a small movie. Uh, and I enjoy a, a good year a lot. Uh, I think that it's it's a it's a good movie to relax with and to watch where something you know with Ridley, uh, uh, with Russell Crowe. I mean, this is two thousand six Russell Crowe, and I don't know if people remember what two thousand six Russell Crowe what he looks like. This is six years after Gladiator, and this is before Body of Lies. Body of Lies is the line of demarcation when it comes to Russell Crowe. When we talk about Body of Lies, I will get a little more into that. So we are still in, we're going to call it Phase 2, Russell Crowe, because Phase 1 is when he had the pre-phase one would be some of the things he had done in Australia, some of the character work. Uh, <laughs> so phase one is him doing things like virtuosity and doing uh, 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 quick in the dead. Uh, and you know, so you've got this guy, you know, this this good-looking, you know, Australian man. Phase two is he is now a genuine movie star and a sex symbol uh i'm sure that there were you know uh, there were some women um and men who have a lot of maximus uh things that they 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 carried in their head putting it in the bank so to say Uh, (laughs) i can't believe i just said that so anyway, this is this is phase two Russell Crowe. And here you have, you know, he, I mean, he's either wearing a nice posh suit or he has got uh, a nice uh, shirt on or maybe a sweater. Hair looks nice. He is rather slender. They're in France. There's wine. Things are going to happen. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, uh, a good year. Um, I, I, I like it because it's a little bit of a departure of some of the things that you would see from uh, a Scott movie. But it still looks a lot like a Scott film. 
where, you know, uh, there are some directors where when you see a movie, you can say that looks like a Spielberg film or that looks like a Kubrick film. Um, maybe, you know, that uh, it's something that Hitchcock would do. And, uh, you know, the, a friend of mine, we had uh, often discussed about how Ridley Scott has a lot of atmosphere and I guess when we're referring to atmosphere, we kind of just mean there's a lot of shit flying around in the uh, in the air uh, that just kind of looks like you're 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 going to constantly just be sick. Uh, spores and uh, bubbles. Uh, there's uh, lint and fur and I don't know. It's, 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 Things that uh, came off of a sheep's wool, just flying around the air. And you're inhaling that shit into your lungs. Uh, it, 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 and in a, a good year, it's not that there's a lot of shit flying around in the air, but there is something about it where I think actually the air feels very clean. You can almost see that it looks clean. And a lot of times with lighting, you, you tend to see some of these uh, different techniques. I know that with the, the, the Scott brothers who were getting into this whole thing about using shards of light. Uh, and there's, you know, uh, you know, with whatever it might be, you know, a little fog, a little this and that. And they definitely do some of that in uh, like someone to watch over me. Uh, you know, there, there, there's a lot of windows and such where, especially in Tom Barringer's, uh, house, little shards of light and a little bit of smoke and such. And, uh, I don't know. I, I've never been in somebody's home where any room ever looks like this. It is the most interesting looking and bizarrely unnatural looking rooms I've ever seen. And that is a trademark of, uh, of Ridley Scott, which I think then got a little bit stolen by Tony and Tony kind of ran with it and started putting that in a lot of his movies. You see it a lot in stuff like True Romance and uh, um, uh, Days of Thunder. Uh, uh, hell, I, I, even the first movie he made, which is probably the most Ridley Scott looking movie uh, that Tony had made, which was uh, uh, the, the hunger. The hunger is the most like Ridley Scott looking Tony Scott movie. I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent there. Uh, so anyway, um, let's see here. Um, yeah. So, you know, it, Okay, so the, like I was saying, these are outliers. Uh, you know, they're both kind of romances. Uh, hmm. The big difference about when I was saying where they they're you know they're they're kind of leaving their comfort zones, whereas Tom Barringer isn't meant to stay in a world that he doesn't really belong in. It turns out that somebody like Russell Crowe, whose character's name is Max in A Good Year, leaving the world that he was a part of is what saves him. And that's what the big difference is. It's about finding the, the joy in leaving the, the, the big hustle. And that someone to watch over me would be more about don't get too caught up on what you might feel is the the comfortable comf comfort zone. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes the best thing about your quote unquote boring life is that it is your life. It is where you find your center and your joy, uh, where your family is, uh, the fact that your 
your wife and your child are what makes it worthwhile. Uh, and I think that's actually what's missing from a good year is that Max doesn't have that. He needs to go find his center. And that's why he needs to leave his comfort zone. Whereas Tom Berenger leaves his comfort zone, but that is where all the special uh, parts of his life exist. You know, it probably gets into this whole conversation about uh, the grass always being greener. Uh, Sometimes you need to take a peek to see whether or not it is green. But always look back at your grass and see how green is your lawn. Does that, you know, does that grass make you happy? Um, now I'm getting a little existential there, so that's a joke. Anyway, though, uh, okay, so let's see here. I will say that if I was to rate this duel... I would see both of these movies. Um, Someone to Watch Over Me. I got it from my library. They actually had to do a, uh, a interlibrary exchange. It's not exactly a very easy movie to find. You can get it on streaming, but you'd have to pay for it. Uh, I was able to borrow it through my library by an interlibrary exchange. Uh, I often find on Reddit that a lot of people complain about how they can't find movies. You know, if you have a library card, go to the library and see if they do, if they have some kind of like interlibrary network. And if your library doesn't have it, they might be able to find it for you. If you don't mind waiting. Uh, And this is coming from somebody who is, you know, a... uh, uh, you know, a physical media guy. I I go to the library, you know, maybe once or twice a week uh, to take out a couple of movies. And I've been doing it a lot lately because I'm undertaking this, uh, uh, this Scott uh, thing right now. Uh, so, you know, I got to see, uh, I got to freshly watch someone to watch over me. Give it a look. Uh, that's my advice. Uh, and a good year that should be available in in various places. Um, I think I had to take that out of the library as well. Anyway, who wins the duel? Um, I am gonna give it to a good year. They're completely different genres, completely different kinds of stories. They at least have some elements that connect them, as I obviously have paired them here. (laughs) But I would say, okay, a good year wins my duel. Um, I think it's a very sweet movie. I think it's an underrated movie. So give it a watch, unironically. Remember that Russell Crowe is one of our uh, our most talented actors. Uh, and give it a watch. Enjoy. Maybe pour yourself some wine. And uh, that uh, that is what I'm going to close on that duel. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll follow this up with our next duel, which is going to be... Let's see, who, who are we doing? It's going to be White Squall... And Black Hawk Down. Uh, Again, I'm wondering if anybody even knows where White Squall is. Uh, Okay, so goodbye for now. Uh, We are now on to our next duel uh, with White Squall and Black Hawk Down. Okay, the first question is, does anyone know what White Squall is? Uh, it's a movie with uh, Jeff Bridges from the 90s uh, and uh, he uh, runs a uh, like a a program of uh, it's like a a, a school at sea Uh, I didn't know this was actually a thing it turned out it's a, a real 
uh, type of uh, uh, education where you would go and uh, learn different subjects, unaccredited, might I add, <laughs> you, but you would get uh, d discipline, you would get uh, uh, education in English, uh, biology, sciences, uh, and seamanship, learning how to sail a boat, uh, and uh, discipline. It was almost kind of like going to the army extremely light uh, and also, you know, learning about uh, Shakespeare. So, White Squall uh, and Black Hawk Down, which might be, I'm guessing, the more known movie between the two of these. If you haven't seen Black Hawk Down, then shame on you. Uh, so, why are these two movies dueling? They are both films about, I guess my theme is going to be teamwork and working together in the face of a, uh, what's going to be a catastrophe. So, <clears throat> uh, both of them also have something very interesting in common, which is that they have a numerous young actors in supporting roles uh, that uh, you, you look at years later and go, oh, look at that, no shit, so-and-so is in that movie. Ha-ha, <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, I guess one of, the, one of the best ones I always like to say is that uh, Tom Hardy is in Black Hawk Down. Um, and I knew that from back then. But I'm sure that some people will be like, what, get the fuck out of here. Tom Hardy's not in Black Hawk Down. I'd be like, I got news for you. Not only is Tom Hardy in Black Hawk Down, the guy who played Mr. Fantastic in the Fantastic Four from uh, 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 2005, he's in this movie too. As is uh, the, uh, the the main bad guy from uh, House of Wax, you know, the, the Paris Hilton movie. He's in this movie. And also, we've got Jeremy Piven. I don't know if he had gotten all of his hair at this time uh, back. You know, for any of us that had seen PCU or uh, Judgment Night, we know Jeremy Piven was like bald, 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 bald. Uh, and uh, so, I don't know, I'm not sure. He, he might have gotten it this time. Uh, there's Richard Tyson, uh, who some people might remember as uh, from the movie Kindergarten Cop. Um, he's the uh, uh, the evil dad. He's in Black Hawk Down. I, you know, I can't name all these people. There, there's way too many people in Black Hawk Down. Uh, <laughs> but I had this whole joke about how in 2001, the year that Black Hawk Down was released, Sort of. It was kind of released like at the end of 2001, January 2002. But uh, 2001, if you were a working British actor and you didn't find work, your agent fucked up. Because 2001 is the year that you get Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, Gosford Park and Black Hawk Down. So <laughs> there's a lot of British actors in Black Hawk Down. There's also a lot of other kind of actors in Black Hawk Down. So we're talking about a movie with soldiers, U.S. soldiers, um, based on a true story, might I add. Uh, you know, the, the Army Rangers and Deltas and the uh, uh, the uh, uh, and the pilots from the air support that are uh, being characterized by actors of uh, let's see there are Americans, Australians, Brits. Uh, there are uh, uh, Danes. Uh, you know, Jamie Lannister is in this movie. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see who. Uh, what other uh, nationality do, might they have? Uh, 
Yeah, my, the, 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 I, I think I'm blanking on some of them, but uh, talk about, uh, you know, if, if you wanted to be in Black Hawk Down, you probably had a better chance not being an American to play an American soldier. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> the White Squall, some of the uh, young actors that they had in that, Scott Wolf. Ryan Phillippe, uh, Jason Marsden. Jason Marsden. I think people know who he is and don't know who he is. Jason Marsden is the voice of Max from a Goofy movie. And he also played one of uh, DJ Tanner's boyfriends from Full House. Uh, who else do we have? We've got... Uh, uh, um, I just completely blanked on his name. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, we'll, we'll we'll come back to him. But anyway, like so, you've got some of these these younger actors that are uh, in this movie uh, playing, you know, all the students upon Jeff Bridges' uh, ship, and. Uh, you know, learning lessons of life, teamwork. Uh, a lot of them are supposed to be these uh, guys who are like privileged and their families kind of sent them off to be, you know, to kind of like uh, maybe get them in you know, to, you know, straighten them out. The big difference is with Black Hawk Down, I, I think you get the feeling that like with the way that a lot of people enter the military, it's because there wasn't a lot of options. Uh, so, you know, the, you know, the, these young people that get sent off into, you know, to, to go serve. So, uh, and I might be kind of talking about both movies in that way. Uh, you know, with the, uh, the, the, what they called the battle of Mogadishu, uh, became like a, uh, kind of a sore point with, uh, the U S military. And uh, the, uh, uh, the um, oh, a, a White Squall is also based on a true story, too. Uh, you know, and the what happens to uh, the ship in that uh, movie, uh, you know, there is a uh, an event that happens where they come upon what's called a White Squall. If you don't know what it is, uh, it's basically like a rogue wave that... Uh, seems to, you know, it's a, it's an event that comes out of like nowhere. Uh, and the rogue wave, uh, you know, just causes the, uh, the ship to upend. Uh, and both movies have a uh, loss of life and there's a tragedy and they have to deal with having lost, you know, loved ones or friends. And it's, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's an extremely uh, hard thing. You know, they, you know, you can't always presuppose, even with soldiers, that, you know, a, uh, that losing your, you know, your comrades is just kind of a part of it. You know, the, the, you know, losing people isn't as easy as what they say. You don't just shake that off. You keep that shit with you. Uh you know, and it's very, it's very tough. Oh, doy. I just remembered the names of the, uh, the other actors in White Squall. Uh, there was uh, Jeremy Sisto uh, and uh, Balthazar Getty. And of course, with Balthazar Getty, we're going to have uh, another connection to a different uh, Ridley Scott movie. All the money in the world which is about the kidnapping of his father. Uh, so crazy, crazy, crazy. Uh, one of the things about White Squall, uh, White Squall has a, uh, a scene in it that actually shows up in uh, another film. Uh, the boat wreck actually uh, um, shows up in Kingdom of Heaven. So it, uh, making its way all over the place. Uh, anyway, so uh, one of the things I want to talk about with Black Hawk Down uh, was that uh, uh, I didn't hear about the movie 
until it had come out. I, it, really crazy. I, I don't actually remember, like, hearing about a marketing campaign for it. It was the strangest shit. Uh, I remember the, uh, I think it was the, uh, the American Film Institute uh, Awards, which 2001 was the first year that they actually had an announcement of the awards and we're going to have a, a ceremony as opposed to just being like a press release like you would do with like the National Board Review or the New York Film Critics Circle. Um, so uh, it said there was like, you know, uh, it said something like along the lines of like uh, Hawk, NABs, such and such award uh, nominations, AFI. And I'm like, Hawk? They mean Ethan Hawk? Uh, and I was like, Black Hawk Down. So I had to I had to look it up, and this is this is uh, to, this is January because I didn't even hear that the movie had really come out in uh, around December. So in early January two thousand two, uh, I had looked up uh, a trailer for it, and this is you know uh, like dial up modem. So you know you get to hear the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I got to watch a uh, nice grainy trailer for Black Hawk Down, and it looked amaze balls. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, so Black Hawk Down is one of the uh, one of the time. It might be the first book that I had gotten into with like, in a way, nonfiction. Uh, I had previously read The Perfect Storm. But with Black Hawk Down, I, I think this was going to be a little different because uh, it was it was almost closer to being written like true crime. Because uh, I, I almost kind of feel that uh, Sebastian Younger had to be almost a little more flowery with the way that he wrote A Perfect Storm. Uh, so, but with uh, uh, with Black Hawk Down, Mark Bowen was you know it was almost like journalism. And it was crazy to see that uh, in the wake of a uh, movie review I had seen for Black Hawk Down, this one reviewer uh, whose name I'm, I'm not going to talk about because I don't want to start a shit storm here, had called it like extremely racist, which I know when you look at this movie where you have... The this uh, like these U.S. troops, uh, and I forget the exact number of them. I, I used to know this off the top of my head. Uh, I'm gonna make an aim and say 110. There were 110 uh, individuals who were in the the quote unquote Battle of Megiddo, who had to fight off, say. Pfft, Two, three thousand Som uh, um, uh, Somalis, and out of the a hundred and ten U.S. troops, I believe all but five of them were white. And I mean, I get it. The optics of that does look a little racist, with having all these white imperialist soldiers mowing down thousands of dark-skinned people. Uh, you know, but I, I think I got a little, a little bit perturbed to find out that that was the truth of it. That there were, say, only five individuals, uh, soldiers, that were not white. So, I mean, how are you going to help that? It's, it just looks like a lot of, a lot of guns in white man's hands mowing down, you know, Africans. Uh, since then, I, I, not that I'm going to say that it is racist. I don't think the movie is racist, but one of the things that does kind of ring true, uh, especially in the week, in the, in the wake of what has, you know, become very evident uh, over these past many years is that uh, you know, the military has uh, 
a lot of systematic racism uh, where certain forces uh, may, you may only make it to, you know, be an army ranger or be in the deltas uh, maybe because of who you are or the way you look. Uh, whereas with, you know, I guess regular infantry, infantry, you know, they'll, they'll, they don't mind just kind of throwing, uh, you know, whatever faces into, uh, into the, 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 the cannonballs, you know, and be the fodder. But, uh, when it comes to being a Delta, uh, you know, it's, uh, you got, you got to have, uh, you got to have, uh, you know, the, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make myself, I'm, I'm going to piss off people by talking about this kind of stuff. <sighs> anyway, um, I enjoyed Black Hawk Down. Uh, I think after coming off of Gladiator, uh, I was, a uh, uh, a very, a very good move, a very, art, a very good uh, technical artistic move to use the kind of uh, filmmaking from Gladiator and it moved right on to Black Hawk Down really well. And uh, yeah, just uh, amazing kind of stuff. Uh, you know, it's great to watch Black Hawk Down. You just see like tons and tons of character actors, uh, and again, remember, this is 2001. Uh, Orlando Bloom is in Black Hawk Down the same year that uh, Fellowship of the Ring comes out. So he's not a star. Uh, let's see, what else we have? Eric Bana, you know, one of, uh, one of Australia's uh, premier comedic actors. Uh, <laughs> being put in, into dramatic action roles. What the fuck were they thinking? Uh, <laughs> uh, anybody who's ever seen Chopper uh, or know about his his past before being put in movies like Munich or Black Hawk Down or Hulk, um, you know th th this guy is he was not a he was not like a dramatic action star. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Ewan McGregor uh, playing a composite of, uh, I believe, was a sex offender. Uh, you know, it's a good thing they changed the guy's name. Uh, yeah. And I got to give a shout out uh, to uh, uh, some of the great uh, accent work in uh, Black Hawk Down among some, you know, some uh, pretty predominant British actors. Uh, instead of hiding their... British accent, kind of more layering it into certain Southern accents, uh, particu particularly like somebody like uh, Jason Isaac. Uh, man, his, you wouldn't even know he's British. Yeah. And Tom Sizemore, always a treat. Always a treat, Tom. And William Fickner, uh, one of our, one of our great uh, unsung gems of an actor. <laughs> Uh, let's see, is there anybody I'm missing? Uh, you know, I guess, you know, I, I think about the, the, the quote that starts that movie, uh, which should only the dead see the end of war. And when it comes to the, uh, the ship of the albatross with, uh, white squall, you know, all these, uh, people who were involved in this, uh, shipwreck, uh, this tragedy, you know, uh, you know, they had to watch their friends die. You know, the soldiers in Mogadishu had to watch their friends die. You know, they, they had worked so hard to work as a team and a unit. Uh, and, you know, they, they had an awful event that they, you know, had to try and survive through. Some did not make it. Uh, and I, you know, it's, it's amazing to see that there could actually be two quite different movies that Scott would make that tackle this, uh, this theme, especially with having, you know, a younger cast, uh, and, 
you know, it being about some kind of heavy, heavy subject matter. Uh, you know, having watched uh, White Squall quite recently, you know, it's a, it is a, unfortunately a forgettable movie. Um, I don't know if it was something that he particularly wanted to make. It's gorgeous. Uh, you know, Black Hawk Down is uh, very sandy, but uh, you know, it itself is also a very gorgeous movie. But uh, you know, it um, for anybody who hasn't seen White Squall, give it a watch. Uh, it's kind of like uh, the uh, Dead Poet Society on the Sea. And, you know, it, uh, Black Hawk Down might not be Dead Poet Society, uh, but it's, uh, you know, being that it's, it's based on a true event, you know, uh, you know, especially since it was coming out, uh, it had been filmed prior to, uh, the, you know, 9-11 and then the events of having to send troops to Afghanistan. Uh, and Iraq, you know, it's it's crazy how, you know, it, uh, the entire another generation had to be these, you know, young men who who went off to go fight, uh, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's I guess it's just a tale as old as time, and only the dead see the end of war. Yeah. Till then, uh, talk later. Goodbye. Christ, you were one beautiful woman. Now you walk out of here. And if you ever see me again, you never saw me before. <laughs>